Welcome to the Annex YouTube channel. A few announcements before we jump into the sermon. Number one, we have an alpha course starting next month. Go to annex.life for all the details and to sign up. It'll be a time where we share a meal, have an open discussion about faith and life and the meaning of it all. We hope that you'll be able to join us for the alpha course. Um, annex.life is also the place where you can give financially to this ministry, as well as submit prayer requests. Let us know um, what we can be doing to pray for you, as well as seek pastoral care. If you need someone to talk to you or work through something with, we are here for you. Thank you so much for being here. Here's the sermon. Good morning. We're going to get started. Let me open us up in some prayer. God, we welcome you right now in this room. We know that your spirit is alive and active that you are present everywhere. We want to be sensitive to how near you are to us, how close you are to us. We pray that as we share moments together and as we open your word, um, that it would come alive, that it would speak to us. Our deepest prayer, God, is that when we gather, we don't leave the same way we came in. So uh, we give you our availability to change us, to mold us into someone more and more like your son, Jesus. In his name, we come to you. And everybody said together... Amen. If you have a Bible, would you go to the book of Psalm, uh, chapter 42. Just crack open the dead center of your Bible and flip a few pages back. Psalm 42. I will read it. We're reading Eugene Peterson's message translation just because I like it. It says, a white-tailed deer drinks from the creek. I want to drink, God. Deep draughts of God. I'm thirsty for God alive. I wonder, will I ever make it, arrive and drink in God's presence? I'm on a diet of tears, tears for breakfast, tears for supper, all day long. People knock at my door, pestering, where is this God of yours? There are the things that I go over and over, emptying out the pockets of my life. I was always at the end of the worshiping crowd, right out in front, leading them all, eager to arrive and worship. Shouting praises, singing thanksgiving, celebrating all of us, God's feast. Why are you down in the dumps, dear soul? Why are you crying the blues? Fix my eyes on God, soon I will be praising again. He puts a smile on my face, he's my God. When my soul is in the dumps, I rehearse everything I know of you. From the Jordan depths to the Hermon Heights, including Mount Mazar, Chaos calls to chaos in the tune of the white water rapids. Your breaking surf, your thundering breakers crash and crush me. And then God promises to love me all day, sing songs all through the night. My life is God's prayer. Sometimes I ask God, my solid rock God, why did you let me down? Why am I walking around in tears, harassed by my enemies? They're all out for the kill, these tormentors with their obscenities. Taunting day after day, where is this God of yours? Why are you down in the dumps, dear soul? Why are you crying the blues? Fix my eyes on God. Soon I'll be praising again. He puts a smile on my face. He's my God. I was reflecting this week on particular moments that I experienced with my children. And specifically, even last night, It's bedtime, and of course, nobody takes it seriously, including myself. And there was a moment with my daughter where she was laughing and crying at the exact same time. Have you ever ever seen that with a kid? Or maybe that's you. Like, I'm I'm like, are you laughing or are you crying? And I'm like, I don't know. I don't think she knows. Like, she doesn't want to be tickled, but also please don't stop tickling me. And I was laughing at that. And I also laughed uh, when children wake up. You ever watch, like, just next time you see a small child nap, observe them as they like awake from the sleep. Something about it, I don't know if it's, it's just so funny to me because they wake up and it's like, where am I? Who am I? Who are you? Why are you, you know? And there's this like daze, this kind of fog that, that they emerge from and they're completely disoriented, looking around and trying to identify what is familiar. The best times when you wake up, or at least a child wakes up, maybe you too, is like after a car ride or have you ever woken up after a plane ride and like you've arrived at the destination and you don't remember exactly how you got there? Like that's what I'm imagining is the life of David. 
Like, I think about him, and I think about my children, and I think how funny it is that he's not sure in this psalm, one of the most famous psalms of David, sung over the last two millennia, if he's laughing or crying. He's disoriented, he's confused, but he's also conflicted. He's like, it hasn't always been this way. I used to be on the front row of the synagogue. I used to be uh, worshiping. I was leading everyone, and now I'm over here, and I'm in the dumps. And, and I just feel like, where is God? And I feel these voices in my head going, where is this God? And at the same time, simultaneously, his soul is singing, but I praise you, and I know you, and I rehearse everything that I know of you, you are my God, you are my Savior. And I think not much changes from when we're disoriented, confused little kids to even when we enter into something like David, authority, kingship, calling, anointing. He is the most, by far, dramatic author in Scripture. He is everywhere. And one thing I love about David is that it's not just like from one psalm of David to the next psalm, you're like, oh, he loves God, everything's great. And the next psalm is like, oh, he's pretty depressed, and I don't really know if this is really an encouraging scripture for me to read today. It's not even, in the, it's not even two different psalms, it's in the same sentence. It's in the same sentence. And oftentimes, when I feel that way, conflicted, I'm in despair, but I'm also praising God, I'm, I'm fearful of the future, but I also remember how faithful he is, and I'm in that I'm not sure if I'm laughing or crying, I'm not sure where God is, but there he is. When I'm in those seasons, I don't know about you, but I often am overwhelmed with guilt. Often I'm like, why do I feel this way? And am I, do I really believe in God? And, 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 and all the questions start to arise. I begin to doubt who I am and who God is. And, and I feel guilty. And I feel like maybe I'm just being negative And I'm doing the Debbie Downer thing. And the wah, wah. Like, you're a pastor, bro. Get it together. And I think David, if he's anywhere in Psalm 42... He is in a place where he knows where God has called him, but he's not sure right now exactly where he is. And that's a place I find myself, and as you follow Jesus, you will find yourself quite often. I know where I'm going, but if you don't mind, could you just tell me where I'm at right now? Is that not the question of 2022? Like, we know what this virus is, but we don't really know whether it's five days or ten days, and, and if you got to wear a mask or not wear a mask, and if you've had it, if you're going to get it again, and, and that's just the virus. And then you talk about politics, and you talk about, my wife and I were talking yesterday, relationships. It's like 2019 was awesome. We built some really strong relationships. I have friends that I've known for years, and then 2020 and 2021 happened, and here we are entering into a new year, and you could name any one of my closest friends, at least in my mind, and my answer to you right now in our relationship status would be, I don't, like, I don't really know where we're at. I don't know what their year has looked like. I don't know how they're doing. They probably don't know how I'm doing. Everything's kind of surface level. And before all of this, I knew where we were. But now I have no clue where we're at. And I know where I'm going. I know where God's called. I'm just not sure where I stand in the moment. David writes this in a moment of affliction, in a moment of disappointment. Here we have a young shepherd boy, Samuel comes, he anoints him as the next king over Israel. He works his way into the palace, he ends in the graces of King Saul. Everybody knows it is David, he is the next king, he is the one chosen by God, he is anointed, and now he's hiding in a cave, running from his life for his life from his enemies with doubt and fear and dismay and disappointment completely overwhelming him. Listen to the drama that David writes. In verse one he says, I'm on a diet of tears. Like, ain't no keto, no paleo. He's like, what do you eat? I eat my tears. Like, bro, that's a little melodramatic. Like maybe tone it back just a bit. And then in verse five, and he's like, but God puts a smile on my face. Isn't it so funny? That when we read David, it's laughable, but when we're living it, we're full of doubt and fear. You read David like, oh, David, you're so annoying, bro. Chill out. God's good. You read the next chapter. But when we're in the story, 
We're like, where's God? Where are you? Is there a God? Who am I? Am I anything? And we just start to allow those thoughts to overwhelm us. Those are the same things that were happening to David. He's, he asked questions like this. I, like, a, like a deer pants for water, my soul thirsts after God. And then he goes, will I, will I ever drink? Will I ever drink again? I love Eugene Peterson's translation. He says, will I even make it? It's like he knows he's the anointed king of Israel. He knows God has a plan. He knows he's chosen. He knows who God is. He just has no clue where God is. And he goes, will I ever be with God again? Those are the questions that I believe still float around in the minds of people who follow Jesus today. Here is David. He actually describes the, these thoughts that are entering in his head. He says, my enemies tell me all day long. I don't know if he really had enemies like shouting down in the cave going like, you're not going to make it. But I know the enemies that are in my head, right? I know the thoughts that float around in my head and I'm going, am I going to make it? Am I going to pull out of this? I know I've tasted and seen the goodness of God, but right now in this moment, I can't feel him. I can't hear him. I cannot see him. Will I ever drink? Will I even make it? Will I ever be with God? And if so, where is he? We are a formula culture. Like, we like the three-point sermons that are like, how to have a successful marriage, right? A, B, C, winning. That's what I like, at least. I, I like the books in parenting that are like eight chapters and eight phrases to remember as you parent your child. You know, like, like 18 things to do before your child turns 18. Let's alliterate it. Let's make it funny. Let's make it rhyme and memorable. And then you have God, who is not formulaic. Every single person in this room has a different story and encounter with God. You may not know him at all. You may encounter him like Saul did on a road, and he may just kind of shock you and go, hey, I'm here, wake up. You may have known him your whole life. You might even not remember a time in your life where you didn't have and know God and have this relationship and hear from him and pray to him. Everyone is different. There is no specific formula, but we can take a little bit of how David goes from I don't know if I'm going to make it to calling my Savior and my rock. God, I don't know where you are, but I certainly do know who you are. I love what he says in verse 4. There are the things that I go over and over. Can you relate? I can relate. It's the money. It's the finances. It's the crying children. It's the, it's the sleeping schedule. It's the future. It's what school to do, what job to take, what person to love. There are the things that I go over and over. He describes it, emptying out the pockets of my life. This is self-examination. This is, this is the existential moment. Why am I? Who am I? I'm looking at everything I have, everything that I own, and I'm trying to examine what is the point. And then he starts to remember, but I was always at the... At the head of the worshiping crowd, I was always right out in front. I was leading them. I was eager to arrive and worship. I shouted praises. I sang thanksgiving. I celebrated. I dined and feasted on the goodness of God. Here is what David is saying. This is how I feel right now. I'm conflicted. I'm not sure if I'm happy or sad. I'm not sure if there is a God, but I think there's a God. I'm not sure if I'm going to make it. I'm not sure if I'm going to pull through this. But he reminds himself in verse 4, he goes, and it wasn't always like this. And if it wasn't always like this, it probably always won't be like this. Like, isn't that the thing we need to tell ourselves in moments of despair and dismay where we're going, God, where are you? We need to Bring to our remembrance that it wasn't always like this. And if it wasn't always like this, then it probably won't always be like this. How do you go from verse 4? There's things that go over and over, emptying out my mind. I, 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 I don't even know. I don't even know who I am. Where is this God of mine? Where is this God of yours? How do you go from verse 4 to verse 5? Where are you? Why, why are you down in the dumps? Why are you crying the blues? I'm going to fix my eyes on God, and soon I'll be praised again. He puts a smile on my face, for he is my God. What's the formula? I have good news and bad news. The good news is it's possible for you 
to proverbially go from verse 4 to verse 5, to go in, God, where are you? And go, God, there you are. It is possible. The bad news is there is no formula for it. There's no, okay, look at, you know, Hezekiah chapter 2, verse 1, the answer. You know, like, isn't that what we want? Is, is God just tell me what to do? He's down in the dumps. One translation puts it, why are you so downcast, oh my soul? Why are you so downcast? The literal word in the Hebrew writing, the, 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 the word picture that you can put into your head is that he is low to the ground. And what I love about David is when he's been brought low, as he's on the ground, instead of just, just staying on the ground and, and letting, letting, you know, getting run over and getting stepped on and staying walked on, he's on the ground. He's been humbled, probably humiliated as an anointed king in hiding. And he chooses in that moment to take advantage of the position he's been placed in. He's choosing in the moment to take advantage of the position that he's in. If I'm on the ground... I might as well turn me eating dirt into bowing down. If I'm already humble and humiliated, I might as well take a moment while I'm down here and while I'm at it to bow before God himself, to recognize that he is God, that I am not, that he is king, and I am yet his humble servant. And while I'm on the ground, I will praise and I will worship. And I love what he says in verse 6. When my soul is in the dumps... I will rehearse everything I know of you. I will rehearse everything I know of you. Matthew Henry put it this way. The way to forget your misery is to remember the God of your mercies. The way to forget your misery is to remember the God of your mercies. If we can give David any credit at all, which I guess he should have because he ended up in the great book, is that at least he's honest. Like at least, like you know what you get with David, right? You open up the Bible and you're like, this man is mad. He is hot and he's cold. He's yes and he's no. I'm not going to go all the way through those lyrics, but he's everywhere and I'm not sure where he's at, but at least he's honest. And more often than not, my prayers are not dishonest. They're just not fully honest. Like, when I talk to God, I'm like, hey, God, it's me. We're good, right? You know? I, David's like, hey, God, where the heck are you, man? You know? Like, he's like in God's face, like, where have you been? And my enemies are around me, and I don't see you, and I don't feel you, and I can't hear you. At least he's honest. Honesty will never surprise or off put God. Honesty with your spouse can be a dangerous situation. Can I get an amen? <laughs> right? Like, honesty with your boss may not keep you a good job for a while. Honesty with your kids, you got to sugarcoat that stuff, you know, man? Like, I, I love you, but, right? That, that's, that's like how I start everything. Son, I love you, but you can't do that. With God, you don't need to do that. But what's so funny is with God, he's the person I do it with the most. God, I love you, and, and I believe you, but... Like, what if we started, God, I'm not sure I love you. And, and I want to believe you, but I, I just don't. And you said, but you're not. Like, at least David is honest. What's, what's so funny about the deepest prayers in Scripture is how incredibly honest they are and how some way in our minds we've conjured up the idea that there, our deepest prayers will not be honest. They'll be formulaic, and they'll be repetitive, and they'll be poetic, and maybe they'll rhyme. And David's like, telling just God the truth. Don't wait till you're put back together to start praying to God, because it's prayer that most often puts us back together in the first place. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know about you, but like, Sometimes when I just feel like nothing is lining up and I'm falling apart and I'm, I'm coming apart at the seams and, and I'm not sure how I'm going to make it and where is God and will I make it out of this when I pray, when I talk to him and converse with him and sometimes I yell at him. It's in those moments where God goes, 
Like, thank you for showing me the pieces of your life. And thank you for showing me the shambles you're in. And thank you for being honest about your situation. Now I can work with honesty. I can work with real. I can work with your mess. Someone said it once. It's all over Instagram. I'm sure you've seen it, that the cure for a confused mind, a weary soul, and a broken heart is prayer. But it's usually my last resort and not my first response. Get the bad news. How am I going to fix it? Get the email. How, how am I going to respond? How am I going to manipulate this? You're arguing with your spouse. You know, how, am I gonna, how are we going to navigate through this? You, you get the, the bill in the mail and you're trying to, trying to do the math and find your own formula and figure out a way to pay it off. My first response is usually, what is Ray capable of? What can I pull off? What can I do? If I consistently treat God as my last resort, I cannot expect him to be the first responder. <laughs> if he's the last call I make, don't expect him to be the first one who walks in the door. But when I make that call first, okay, God, I got this. I'm not sure. I have some ideas of how I would handle it, but I want you to handle it. I want you to tell me what to do. I want you to give me the path forward. I want you to light this way, and I'll walk whichever way you want me to walk. Watch how God responds. At least David's honest. And it's in that honest prayer, and probably during the honest prayer, that communion with God takes place. It's like when he's on his knees, when he's screaming out to God, when he's pounding his chest going, where are you? What is happening? I don't think I'm going to make it. And it's in that honest moment he goes, and then I begin to rehearse everything that I know of you. Then it, then it just starts to all come back. As you begin in your prayer life, however you pray, to describe your situation to God out loud, and you say, God, here's the situation. What comes to your mind is all the times you've been in a similar situation or someone in scripture was in a worse situation and how God came through. God, this is a situation. It looks dire. I don't think I'm gonna make it. Oh yeah, the Israelites didn't think they were gonna make it. Oh yeah, David didn't think he was gonna make it. Elijah didn't think he was gonna make it. Jesus is in the garden, so stressed out and full of anxiety that he's got, don't let this happen. And sweat is pouring from his face and and and. and there's small, tiny vessels in his face that are bursting out of the stress, and he begins to bleed from his sweat glands. And then he brought about the redemption of all mankind. It's like, well, I describe aloud my frustrations with God, that God's faithfulness begins to rehearse within me. I rehearse everything I know of you. I, reverse, I rehearse everything I know of you. I was thinking about 19th century preacher Spurgeon, and he's probably the most quoted preacher in history. They used to call him the prince of preachers while he was alive, you know? Like, I mean, thank God there wasn't YouTube or this guy would have had an enormous head. <laughs> and, and he would, somebody would transcribe all of his sermons, and they, every year they put it into a book, and people would buy these beautiful sermons. His rhetoric, his like vocabulary still blows my mind. The way he could close his eyes and almost paint words into the hearts of people was amazing. But all through his life, even in his autobiography, he admits to struggling with depression and anxiety. These ups and downs, these moments at 19 years old in the Metropolitan Tabernacle preaching to 14,000 souls pre-microphone days. People coming to the Lord, revivals happening, people finding forgiveness, families reunited and whole, people overcoming addiction, and people being freed from poverty. It was just amazing ministry that he gave. And as he spoke, he was so full of God's spirit that people's lives would change. He literally gets up one day in the middle to, to try to figure out the size of a room as he's, as he's, as he's uh, kind of just examining, like, how big is this room? How much do I have to yell? There's no microphones. And he gets up and he says, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And he's just kind of listening to his voice reverberate and echo. And the guy who came early to church is in the back row. 
And he finds Jesus in that moment. And he's like up at the altar and, and he's like, I was just... I was just trying to figure out the room. I was just mic checking. That's all we were doing right now. And in his days of despair and depression and heartache in his marriage and his family, he would call in sick. One day he decides, I'm not going to preach. And so he, he finds his way into a small Methodist church. He figures, I could go to church today and, you know, I can, I can just sit here in the back row And in this, as he writes in his autobiography, he says, I was struggling with the fact I wasn't even sure if I believed what I preached. And if the goodness of who Jesus was was something I had even had had a taste for anymore. And so he he walks into this Methodist church, and the Methodist preacher wasn't a full-time preacher. He had a job. He was an engineer. And so he didn't always have time to write out full sermons. And he says he sat there, and he said he went there to try to find some taste of the gospel, some taste of God's goodness, something to reignite some fire in his soul. But while he's sitting there, the voice in his head is saying, look at you, you used to be the cook, and now you're the waiter. You used to be up there, and now you're, you're sitting down here. And those voices are speaking to him. Will I even make it out of this pit? And he sits there. The Methodist preacher, without enough time to prepare his own sermon, took a sermon from one of Spurgeon's published books of all of his sermons, opened it up, and preached Spurgeon's sermon to a room full of Methodists with Spurgeon sitting on the back row. He said his heart welled up and his eyes welled over with tears. He became overwhelmed with the truth that God loved him, that the gospel was real, that love was real. And he walks up. And he said, everything was reignited, everything was aligned. God reminded me who I am, why I am called, where I am going, and what purpose I have on this planet. And he walks up to the preacher to thank him afterward, and he goes, I don't know if you know this, but that was one of your sermons. And he said, I do know, but it was exactly what God needed me to hear today. I thought about that story all morning long. And oftentimes, let's be honest, if I can be honest with God, maybe I can be honest with you, oftentimes, as someone who's dedicated their life to the church, I wake up, and I just go like, what am I doing? Like, Ray, go get a J-O-B, go get out there, get a job, you're qualified, make this happen, you know? You got three college tuitions coming up in just a decade, like this is, you gotta figure this out, bro. And sometimes I'm like, why, you know, why are we even, I remember especially right in the thralls of COVID. I remember being in this room staring at a camera and nobody here. And they probably have footage, Isaac can always sneak it up on me later, I'm sure, of me right before the sermon just like frustrated and angry or sad or crying and just like, this is awful, there's nobody here. And I remember starting sermons over again, like, hey, just cut that, we'll just do it again. And I'd just be so upset. And all that while, the voices in my head was, where is God? What is he doing? I'm on a diet of tears. This is awful. And I feel like God over the last year has been teaching me something that nobody wants to be taught. Growing up in church, they always say, don't pray for patience because God will give you things to be patient about. What I believe God is teaching David in this season as he writes Psalm 42 and what quite possibly he's teaching you and I today is trust. Do you trust me? Do you trust me? Great, you trust me? Let me take everything out of the equation. Now do you trust me? Do you trust me? Yeah, I trust you, cool. I'll be right back for an undisclosed amount of time. You'll just be here without me. Do you trust that he's coming back? Do you trust that he saves the day? Do you, do you trust that he'll provide for you and your family? Do you trust that he can heal, that he can make you whole? Do you, do you trust him over the news and trust him over your health and trust him over your own understanding? What God is teaching David is a very painful lesson for you and I to learn. It is do you trust God? Because until I'm in a place where I'm drinking and eating my own tears for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, like David puts it, I will never know how much I really trust God. It is so easy for the blessed person to show off the new car, the new house, the new job, the new digs, the new shoes, and go, 
God is good, brother. It's like, and so is obviously your life and your paycheck and whatever doors got open for you. What I want to see is the person who has nothing to hope for, nothing to count on. Write down like David, with nothing in my hands, still I will praise you. That is the truest test of your faith and your trust in Jesus. When there's nothing else left and where God seems nowhere to be found, will you still bow and praise? Isn't that not what the whole book of Job is about? Takes everything from him, his money, his land, his houses, his property, his children, his health, his own sanity, and he says, though he slay me, yet I will still praise him. That is where it matters most. Following Jesus, this book of love and redemption and mercy and forgiveness, I love the idea that is in our Western American church that God's gonna bless us and I believe he will and that he can and that he does bless. But the core of the gospel is not now we enter into blessing. The core of the gospel is that we believe in blessing when we have none. That we believe in forgiveness when we don't feel like it. That we trust God when we cannot see him. The Bible says we walk by faith. And faith only matters in the moments like David of fear and frustration and turmoil. He says, I rehearse everything I know about you. If you're in a season or you've been in a season and if you haven't yet, you'll be in one soon or you feel like I don't know where God is. I know a lot of people politically and ideologically feel this way, like where's God in America right now? Where's God in schools? We're about to send our our son off to school, we've been visiting schools, trying to figure out a way, how do we raise someone who loves and knows Jesus for who he really is and not sacrifice eight hours of his day in a place where he may not learn and know and discover that? Where's God in my marriage right now? Where's God in my finances? I look at the checkbook and I'm like, God, where, where are you? You said you'd take care of me. Where, God, where are you in, in whatever you're facing? Maybe it's a diagnosis. Maybe it was a letter you got. Maybe it was a loss of a loved one. Where are you, God? As you face those things, my question to you is, what can you rehearse about what you know about God? What can you right now bring to remembrance Like David had to. You got me through it then, you can get me through it now. You healed me then, you can heal me now. You showed up then, I believe you can show up now. Even right now when I can't see you or feel you or hear you, I don't even know if I know you, and I don't know where you're at in the situation, and not only that, but my emotional health, God, is at an all-time low. What can I remind myself about who God is? About his faithfulness? his goodness, his forgiveness, his mercy, his love. Not only that, David was anointed. He waited years and years and years between his anointing in the field and his appointing as king. Trusting God in the middle of that was the challenge. Trusting God between the anointing and the appointing. Trusting God between the engagement and the marriage. Trusting God between the ages of 1 and 18. Trusting God in your finances when you're not sure if you're going to ever get into the black or into the green. That's where it counts. What can you remind yourself of? I thought about even just our church. Here's where I'm at as a preacher. Usually, I remember at one point, Josh, you'll remember this. At one point, my, my title was the pastor of preaching and vision. Do you remember that? We were so trendy. And, <laughs> and I'll be honest. I'm like, can we just scratch the second half off of it right now? Because I don't know where we're at or where we're going. I'm just trying to get through this next Sunday most days. And, and I felt like God this week and over the last several months has been like, hey, man, you all didn't have a meeting space three weeks before you launched this church. Three weeks before, we were like ready. We had bought stuff. We had... 
team training. We were ready to go. And everybody's like, when's church? I'm like, February 9th, baby, you know? And everybody's like, all right. I was like tweeting it out, location TBA. We didn't have one. I remember at Noah's Event Center, we were sitting there, and, and they, were, they were like shady characters, right? Like they were shady. <laughs> thousands and thousands of our dollars just being sucked out of our bank account. And, and I remember like, this is where you wanted us, God. This is a good location, and we all seem to really have settled in here, and this is happy. And I remember we, we, we like, someone sent me the news article in the middle of the night that they had like declared bankruptcy and that their CEO got arrested for fraud and they locked all the doors. If you had a wedding plan there, like you were, you were out of it. Like, nope, sorry, no wedding here this weekend. And we were like, where are we gonna have church? I remember when they told us two weeks to flatten the curve and we all got in a little foyer of a church we were sharing with some friends and we all sat there going, what do we do? How are we gonna do this? What is this gonna look like? How long will this last? I remember in my marriage, not sure if we were gonna have children or make it to the next steps. I remember Remember in my finances, not knowing where things were going to come from, how God was going to provide. I remember my friend's diagnosis of cancer and wondering, is this it? Is this the end? And I can call to remembrance how faithful God was through all of that. And then all of a sudden, my soul isn't in the dumps. Then all of a sudden, I go, God puts a smile on me. I'll be smiling again soon. And then things don't seem so bad. Even while they're bad, He's good. He's gracious. He's kind. And maybe the lesson right now that I'm learning isn't that I'm all alone. Maybe the lesson that God's trying to teach us is whether or not we trust him. What's trust? Trust is trust is trust. You either trust him or you don't. I'm talking Jasmine and Aladdin. Do you trust me? You either hop on that magic carpet and let him show you the world or you don't. There's no formula for it. I wish I could tell you three points today. What a great sermon at Annex Church. How to trust God. You either do it or you don't. I want to be the church. I want to be the community. I want to be the father and the husband that can be in the middle of a mess when I don't know where God is. But I know who he is. And I can rehearse everything I know about him. I know he's loving. I know he's faithful. I know he's kind. I know he promised never to leave me or forsake me. I know he pro promised to provide for me, to take care of me. I know he told me that if I seek first his kingdom, that all the rest will be added to me. I know that he said that the world of the generous gets larger and larger, so I'm going to be generous. I know that he said that I should put others first before my own needs. So I'm going to serve people. I know that he said that, that, that he leaves the 99 for the ones. So I'm going to go look for the lost, and I'm going to go look for the lonely people of this world and befriend them and encourage them. I know he said to meditate all day and all night on good things that are good report, that are kind and thoughtful and uplifting. And so I'm going to be that kind of person. And I know that if he can meet David down in the slumps, then he can meet me where I am today. And he can meet you too. I'm sitting there tickling my little girl and I'm not sure if she's laughing or crying. <laughs> and I felt like God sometimes looks at us and he's like, Ray, Josh, Mike, are you laughing or crying? <laughs> like what, you let me, do, what's, the, what's the deal here? And my answer to God is yes. <laughs> I am laughing and crying, God. I believe you and I don't. I'm happy and I'm sad. I have faith for the future, and I also am not sure if I'm going to wake up tomorrow. And God sees me in that place, and he loves me all the same. Can I pray for you? God, I admit, I guess we'll just be honest, that we've seen you do some amazing things. We've felt you. We've heard you. And there are moments, and some of us are in that moment right now, God, where we're just not sure where you are. Where have you been? When are you coming through? We're staring at the door waiting for you to come in and save the day. Would you allow us while we wait to trust, to rehearse and practice what we do know about you? 
We may not know where you are, but thank you for showing us in your son Jesus on this planet who you are and that you do come and that you're not forgetful of us. You're just patient and kind to us. Increase within us trust and obedience, faith, even in the middle of a mess, that you are good, that you are who we, you say we are, and that you are. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen.